calling the meeting to order. Uh, we will begin with a roll call. Kathy, please. Can we have a roll call? Kathy, uh, either your mic is muted or... We have everybody muted. There you go. We've got a little. Yeah. Okay, let me start that over. Terrianna Stack. Here. Commissioner Labra. Here. Commissioner Holland. Here. Commissioner Tisdale. Commissioner Tisdale. Here. Thank you. Commissioner Zelensky. Here. Commissioner McGinn. Here. Commissioner Lark. Here. Commissioner Finch. Commissioner Finch, you may be muted. Can't hear you. Here. Thank you. Is that is that all commissioners who are present? Yes, answer up. Present. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Before we uh, go any further, I have some. Uh, general instructions for all participants in the call tonight, just reminding that the situation we're currently dealing with is constantly changing. And as part of the governor's Safe Start proclamation, the Planning Commission is conducting our meeting remotely. Unfortunately, we are not able to allow members of the community to gather in person or attend. We want to protect you and your families and recognize the need for social distancing. We encourage you to provide comments or concerns on any matter via email at planning at everettwa.gov. You may also watch the meetings on Comcast Channel 21 or Frontier Channel 29 or online at www.everettwa.gov slash everettchannelstream. You may also listen in telephonically if you do not have digital access. Please call 1-425-616-3920, conference ID 378-633-930-POUND. The public is allowed to participate via the same call-in number and conference ID. If you are accessing this meeting via phone, please be aware that there is about a 10 second delay on the broadcast and stream. If you wish to download the presentation materials or wish to comment and need to see the visual in real time, please visit everettwa.gov slash planning commission. I would like to remind anyone participating to please mute your microphone and on your phone, you can do that by pressing star six until you might be called upon. When it is time for public input, uh, Kathy Davis will be calling on those uh, members of the community who have pre-registered to speak for tonight's hearing. After we've heard from those speakers, others on the line will be called on by the last four digits of your phone number, and you'll be asked if you wish to speak, and remember that star six toggles the mute function of your phone. Please make sure if you do speak that you state your name and address as way of, by way of introduction and that once finished, you please mute yourself again. If there are any disruptions or interruptions during the meeting, we do have a mechanism to um, remove uh, any disruptive uh, participants. 
Um, thank you for your patience and understanding. We know these are challenging times, and we appreciate your willingness to be transparent, to continue to reach out to our community, and to keep everyone informed as we navigate through this, this time. Uh, with that, uh, I would ask if there is a motion to, if, if everybody, if all the commission members have had an opportunity to review the minutes from last meeting and if anyone has a motion to approve. This is Commissioner this is Zielinski and I would move approval of the July 22nd minutes. This is Commissioner Lavra, I'll second that. Thank you. We have a vote. Commissioner <clears throat> Lark. Abstain. Commissioner McGinn. Yes. Commissioner Zelinsky. Yes. Commissioner Tisdo. Yes. Commissioner Holland. Yes. Commissioner Labra. Yes. Terry Anasak. I'll abstain. So it looks like that the minutes are approved. Uh, with that, I'll ask if there's any uh, members of the commission who have anything to report. Anyone? I can just, uh, oh, this is Commissioner Lark. Uh, I just want to say oh, hello ahead. from, uh, from uh, South Korea and to reaffirm that, uh, you know, all of my opinions expressed tonight are my own opinions that do not represent that of the U.S. Uh, Department of the Army or the DOD. On top of that, I also want to say having an opportunity to travel around here in South Korea and see land use patterns here has been extremely informative, very engaging. And I have to say, I absolutely love how they how they manage their mass transit here, and uh, how they stack basically density right on top, literally skyscrapers right on top of metro stations. So it's been a very wonderful learning experience exploring this country. All right, thank you. Thank you. Any other commissioners? Okay. With that, how about? Staff comments, David. Yeah, uh, David Stalheim, uh, interim planning director. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, commission members, for spending another lovely evening uh, here in Everett uh, at a planning commission meeting. Um, just an update on uh, upcoming meetings uh, quickly: is uh, the next regular meeting is September first, uh, two weeks from now, and we have no plans to have that meeting. Um, uh, unless there's a, a reason at the end of the hearing tonight that the commission members uh, feel to uh, have a meeting on September 1st. But we are planning to have a special meeting on September 8th. And that special meeting on September 8th uh, would be the day after Labor Day, but it would be to uh, consider the uh, comments and uh, potential changes to the uh, draft plan and code amendments that are uh, being presented in public hearing tonight. And uh, considering to take action and make a recommendation to City Council on September 8th. Um, we also are planning to have a public hearing the following week on September 15th for an application uh, that uh, you've probably heard of from Housing Hope uh, for comprehensive plan amendment and rezone for property by Sequoia High School in the Norton Playfield. I want to remind uh, commission members, I think we've talked about this before, is that this is a quasi-judicial land use matter, and so you should avoid having any uh, communication with any proponents or opponents or anyone in the public uh, regarding this application uh, at this time. If anyone sends you any kind of communication, um, please forward that to Kathy Davis, and Kathy will make sure that it's distributed to everyone on the commission so everyone has uh, the same information uh, going into decision making uh, on that. So so uh, September 15th is the uh, planned uh, public hearing for that application. So other than that, uh, that's it for update right now. Okay, so we do only have one major item on the agenda tonight, and that is a public hearing on the, the Rethink Zoning um, proposals. Uh, 
Before we open the public hearing, though, I would ask if there's any uh, planning commission members with questions or comments. This is Commissioner Lavra. I do have a question um, for David. Sure. Before we, <laughs> we have our um, action meeting on September 8th, are we going to see the responses or action in response to all of the public comments? Yes, you will. Uh, my uh, intention is after uh, uh, tonight uh, we have... Uh, uh, public input is that we will be preparing a, a package of both responses, uh, just a, a narrative that talks about, uh, you know, uh, what we heard and uh, what our response and suggestions, recommendations are to the Planning Commission. And you'll get a package of uh, amendments. I mean, we've seen, uh, you know, several things already that uh, we anticipate uh, uh, presenting to you for consideration of amendments to both the code and the and the plan uh, as presented to you. Um just uh, I did want to do a quick update uh, before the hearing too is that there's one comment that or a couple comments that came in uh, with respect to uh, non-conforming lots in a merger clause if uh, people have uh, dove into the public comments um, which are all on the website um, and uh, that was uh, something that we were doing before we uh, scaled back some of our single family uh, changes and so that was uh, another staff member that was writing that chapter, uh, chapter 38 for nonconforming and wasn't aware that that was in there. And so uh, the issue of the merger clause and the potential infill in some of those single family neighborhoods, we will be coming with a back to you with a recommendation to uh, restore what the existing code provisions are for the uh, merger lots. And so I just wanted to get that up front uh, in case uh, people wanted to speak to uh, that tonight is that uh, that was something that really should have been removed when we uh, scaled back the, the changes in the single family zones. Okay. Mr. Lavra, any, any other questions? Well, I sort of didn't understand their comments because it didn't seem like it was saying what they said it said, but uh, <laughs> I'll just wait to see your response. Yeah, we'll uh, we'll go into uh, responding to uh, things as, as as much as we can. And, and again, uh, one of my uh, intentions is to try to get all the responses done by the end of next week. And so we'll get a package uh, to everyone by um, hopefully in the mail by the the twenty eighth. And so it'll be out uh, for both you and and the public to review uh, well in advance of your action meeting on the eighth. Thank you. Thank you. Any other commissioners with uh, questions or comments at this time? This is Tisdall. I, um, I I wonder with all that's gone on with this COVID deal in the last four or five months, you listen to the real estate market and the finance market, and I guess my question is if if how hard is it going to be to amend what? we may do because the question comes around people um, that are currently uh, moving out that were uh, in uh, and were part of the uh, solution of uh, going vertical now uh, this new work from home and all those kinds of things you know as we're rethinking zoning here the market is shifting underneath of us, and it's. Um, I, I, I guess, David, I asked the question: What if in a year, uh, all that you're hearing about in some of the real estate activity and land uh, acquisition activity that you're seeing, um, what, what if that needs to be modified? The um, so the the code is. Um, you know, first off, I, the intention of some of the writing that we've done is to provide a little bit more flexibility than has been done in the past. Uh, for example, when you look at the Chapter 5 and the use tables, we have almost half the number of uses that we do in the existing code, so there's a lot more flexibility. It's a little bit more of a performance-based zoning approach. Um, 
So rather than uh, detail every type of commercial establishment and the parking requirements for it, it's a more uh, generic uh, description of retail and, and general office uses, things like that. And so so I, I would say, first off, I, I think that uh, we've kind of built a lot of that into it uh, to hopefully uh, be a little bit more uh, nimble for the future. Uh, but second, it is just uh, code things. And the only thing that really is less uh, flexible is where you have to do a comprehensive plan amendment because that can only happen one time per year. And when we consolidated all the land use uh, map designations a uh, year, year and a half ago now, um, we had uh, reduced it from 30-some designations down to six. And so we have far greater flexibility uh, now to deal with code amendments than we did in the past. And so uh, if, if things come up, and I guarantee, I think you're right, Commissioner Tisdale, things will come up. I, it's not a uh, if, it's probably a when. And uh, and that would be something that uh, can be brought up uh, to address. And, you know, we did that with the Metro Ever Plan. We, we found a few situations after we adopted Metro um, within the first year where we found some things that just weren't working and weren't written exactly the way that they were intended, and we came back with modifications within a couple months of that. Okay, I, I just the, the reason I ask is I, I don't want to get skipped over again. I, I mean, the city of Everett, you know, and uh, there's a push in Seattle. There's 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 just a push in a lot of places and uh, up and down the coast. Uh, I was in California two weeks ago, and it's the same same thing happening happening there. These people are. You know, the box store guys are going, whoa, 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 no, I don't want that store. I don't want that location. So now this landowner's there was, it's owned for a box store and now it's not. So if what you're telling me is it's going to actually be easier to uh, turn that into another use, um, I, I just want to make sure that we have a uh, an open arm and the people that might be looking at us to uh, develop or to buy or whatever that that we're uh, that we smell good, look pretty, and got have our lipstick on, so that we we they come to Everett as opposed to Marysville and Monroe and Gold Bar and Stanwood and those things. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Tidwell. Anyone, any other commissioners with questions or comments? This is Commissioner Zelinsky. I just have one suggestion for staff as it's preparing its responses to the public comments. I noticed uh, in a couple of the comment letters, there was some concerns expressed about changing changes that are being proposed to the decision-making uh, process for various types of approvals that are presumably the ones covered in uh, Title 15. So my suggestion would be to maybe prepare a table that shows, list out all the various types of land use approvals that are covered in Title 15, and then indicate how, who is the decision maker currently, like if it's the planning director or the hearing examiner, and then who would be the decision maker under the proposed amendments, just so it's clear exactly what the changes are. And I think it would also be helpful to for the staff to articulate the reasons for why the proposed change. Yeah, and this is uh, David Stahlheim. Just uh, so we, if you look at the summary documents that we provided to you and available on the website for Title 15, we've we've identified all the changes in the Title 15 procedures and decision making uh, for that, and so you can see. Uh, those changes with respect to uh, individual land use decisions, really that's a, a, a matter of looking at chapter five in the use tables. And since our use table is not the same use table as the previous use table, that, that's that's not a uh, possible task. Um, you, you just need to go through chapter five and if you see anything that's in chapter five, and I think we presented the chapter five draft table dating back probably to January, February to the planning commission and also to city council. Um, if you see anything in there that you think is a use that should be um, 
uh, not a staff decision or not a, a planning director decision with notice to neighbors and needs to have a public hearing, then you just need to go through that use table and identify which uses you think need to move. Um, we spent considerable amount of time uh, internally and with uh, some other customers uh, going through that and um, feel comfortable with uh, where we have things uh, in that. But if the commission sees some uses that uh, they have some questions, then just please go through chapter five and identify you know, those things that might have a P being permitted, uh, that means there's no notice to uh, neighbors on it. Uh, a is administrative, which uh, has notice in a planning director decision. And then a C is a uh, public hearing in front of the hearing examiner. So if you see anything in that table that you think needs to move, then uh, please let us know. Mr. Zelensky, anything else? Any other questions? Uh, no, no further questions. I'm just not entirely sure that the summary that you prepare, David, actually does what I'm suggesting the table would do. But I'll give it a second look in case you're, if you're convinced that it really does. Well, I guess what I'm trying to explain is that it's an impossible task to identify every land use change of what's right now a hearing examiner decision or a planning director decision and going to administrative because the existing chapter five and uses I, I can't remember has 160 or 170 different land use categories and now we're down to 80 some categories and so it's not a apples to apples comparison um so you just you just need to go you know you and the public need to go through uh chapter five and if you identify any of those uh, permissions that need to move uh, into a different category. I just need to know that list of what you have as part of that. You know, it's just it's just not um, uh, possible for us to go through and, and do what uh, perhaps is being suggested right now. Would it be helpful for commissioners if I showed the screen of what that looks like? Does does anybody want to see that? I think that could be helpful. Okay, let me. I will. I will do that here. Okay. Um, so if you look at my screen, so this is in Chapter Five um, right now, and so. So what I'm saying is that these these use tables are entirely new. They're largely built off the Metro Everett, but they are not what's citywide. And so you can't, I, I can't say how every one of these uses is the same as others. I mean, we have different definitions of dwellings, things like that. And so what I'm saying is that like for bed and breakfast houses right here uh, for a B and B, we have P in this category for multifamily uh, going into commercial. Uh, P is permitted. Uh, that's no notice to neighbors. Uh, if if you think it needs to be administrative where there's notice but a planning director decision, you just need to go through this type of list and identify which uses in here do you think uh, are needed to move from one category to another. And so this is uh, the residential table. And if I scroll down and hopefully you don't get too dizzy as I scroll here, if I look at the commercial table, for example, uh, alcohol production, microbreweries, we have uh, administrative use in uh, 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 UR4 zone with, with a note. Uh, it's only on mixed corridor street. And so that's uh, not a hearing examiner decision. This is a planning director decision with notice to neighbors um, right there, for example. And then P again is permitted. So if you just go through this and if you thought any of these uh, things should change to a higher uh, review level, uh, just circle those and identify those and then send that in as part of the um, uh, package that we can look at and, and respond to. Thank you, David. This is Commissioner Zelensky again, and I I fully appreciate the the difficulty of doing that kind of a table for this uh, use table. 
But unless I'm misunderstanding some of the comments, I thought some of them had to do with other kinds of land use approvals that are discussed in uh, Title 15, such as shoreline master program permits, um, variances, short plats, all of the things that are covered in there. If there were changes being made to the decision maker on those kinds of actions, uh, that that, sh that could be shown in a fairly simple table, I would think. But maybe there are no changes. But uh, again, the comment letter I read, I thought they were dealing with that as much as with the uses in Table 5. Yes, there there are changes, and those are detailed in Chapter in Title 15. So those things tied back to um, so this is all the description. So the changes uh, in here, this talks about land divisions for shore plats and plats. Uh, and this talks about uh, shoreline jurisdiction right here. So that's all detailed there. Uh, and here's the detail about uh, changes in historic. So all that is in Title 15 summary document. And David, that document tells you who is the decision maker today and who it would be under the proposed amendments? Uh, yes, it does. So um, so right here, um, for example, it says state law allows for summary approval by administrative staff of short plats or short subdivisions, which is the division of land into 10 lots, uh, less than 10 lots. Uh, there's no requirement of state law for public notice of the application and so the draft is consistent with that and so that's so, so that's the way it's done now and that's the way it will be done in the future no the way it's done now is so this is a change so this says changes from current practice so the change right now is that there is notice for that it's the same decision maker but there is notice for that i see okay Thank and you. then as you walk down for shoreline permits there's changes in the decision making of, of who's the decision maker. So the hearing examiner would hear shoreline variance, shoreline conditional use permits, and any uh, request to increase heights to accommodate industrial activities. Planning director would have other Rev 2 uh, decisions and staff would be uh, some other decisions. For shoreline permits, I wanna uh, make note is that the public notice requirements are actually set out in the Shoreline Management Act, and so none of the public notice requirements change except for uh, the posting of property. So everyone within uh, 300 feet of a shoreline permit would get notice of a shoreline permit as part of that. Uh, historic, there's no changes in decision making. There is change that the addition of an accessory dwelling unit, alteration of significant features of a local registered property, and additions to a building with three or more dwelling units uh, would not get notice to neighbors, but the historic commission would be reviewed. And this has always been a planning director decision and would continue to be a planning director decision. Okay, thank you, David. Yeah, and I'll, I'll work to uh, summarize that based on uh, the comments so that you'll have that in a, um, a narrative too. Any other commissioner questions or comments at this time? David? Am I, am I on? You're on. Yeah, go ahead. How, how much input have you received from AGC or master builders or architects, land use folks? Have, have, have you got out to a group of those folks that are actually going to have to use this and uh, gotten any input? Well, we, we've sent it out to a wide list of folks and, um, you know, so far, um, you know, and I've had conversations with master builders, honestly, their their bigger interest was some of the infill housing, which we backed away from. Um, so the issue of uh, additional townhouses, things like that are, are the things that they were really interested in and wanted to be supportive of, and we're not doing that as part of the rethink. So, so I think that they've kind of backed out of uh, looking at this anymore uh, at this point, because that's uh, one of their primary interests. Um, but they may be on the call tonight and um, perhaps they'll provide input. 
Okay. Thank you. You bet. Anyone else? Okay, hearing nothing else from commissioners, let's go ahead and open the public hearing for input. Uh, I don't know if we had anybody sign up in advance to speak. Kathy, um, do you have anybody that you have a list that you want to call through? David Koenig. Can you hear me? Yes. yes, we hear you. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. I uh, sent a comment letter last week to the commission, and I hope you had an opportunity to uh, read it. Um, this is a very complicated effort that you're doing, um, and I don't, uh, um, you know, um, yeah. you, you have a lot of responsibility in what you're doing, and there, there's a lot going forward, and and I, um, uh, I'll make my comments and leave it at that. But uh, when the pause on the single family and transit overlay happened um, uh, and affected single family zone areas, I supported that. But there are code changes in the current proposal which would affect single family zoned areas, which are significant. Uh, somebody has something coming in here, they need the mute. Um, uh, I am concerned that once it was communicated that single hey, family. Hey, Dave. Hey, Dave. Dave could, you, yeah. could you pause for just one second? Uh, hey, Jeff or Pipa, I, I think it's coming off of your bridge line. Kathy, feel free to mute people in the public comments section. It's still, I think it's coming across. I'm seeing it coming, Pipa, on your line. Okay, now it's gone. Oh, now it's back. Okay, Pipa, it's still coming in on your line, I think. It is from somebody who is not muted in the meeting, in uh, the public comments meeting. Okay. If I could remind everybody who's not speaking at this time to please uh, mute your microphone. Uh, we'd appreciate it. Thank you. Mr. Koenig, sorry for the interruption here. Um, we can go ahead and resume. Okay. Yeah. I am concerned that once it was communicated that the single family and transit only there were paused, then many uh, citizens stopped following the rethink zoning effort. I recommend that code changes which affect single family areas be paused or rejected, including the subdivision changes, the merger clause removal, public input uh, changes that which would reduce uh, public notice requirements to citizens, changes to who makes land use decisions, criteria for modification of code standards. Uh, that's both in um, the standards of the design and the standards for lots. And then also the option for measuring the heights of buildings. Um, I think this is really important because the inability to get together and uh, a lot of people are under stress these days and they're more trying to survive than uh, get involved with civic engagement. Uh, first specific is public notice requirements. One specifically one is uh, there's not a change to the historical commission making a decision, but there's a change that people who live in the area, the notice requirement goes away for, for their actions. So um, I have a strong belief after many years um, working in the public sector that it's important to have informed citizens, and that should be a goal of the city, and that uh, citizens bring good input to things and bring up perspectives which staff may not have thought of uh, and the information uh, of the neighborhood and history, which staff may not know, especially in Everett today, because there's been such a turnover in staff. Uh, most staff there have only been there a short time and they don't have 
the background or the history of what is in the neighborhoods that the citizens who live there would do. The other was in changes in who makes the decisions and then specifically the hearing examiner on shoreline permits. And I won't go into the details. Uh, uh, Mary Cunningham and her comments go into detail in that and gives an example of that. Um, uh, shoreline permits can be very controversial, especially related to public access. And there is a lot of pressure put on staff uh, by the port and by elected officials, uh, i.e. the administration, to often um, uh, not follow the standards uh, that are there. And uh, Mary described in her uh, note to you uh, in detail in a specific uh, example recently, which I also commented on, and, uh, and uh, the hearing examiner went in a different position than what the staff was originally going to, which created more public access in that area. The other provision is um, related to um, uh, land subdivision, the exemptions to minimum lot area, width, depth, frontage, and lot standards. Basically, um, uh, there's a way without any real um, um, criteria that, uh, you know, there's, there shows lot standards, but basically through the modification process, you can ignore all those things. And I think that's just, you know, you need to have something uh, some either uh, reject that modification or come up with some criteria that uh, why that could be changed. It's basically up to the planning director's discretion. And uh, again, a lot of pressure is put on uh, uh, planning directors to uh, modify codes. And this is a wide open uh, thing uh, in terms of doing that. And along with also the standards related to the design of the buildings. So um, there are standards in the code for in this code for um, lots, and there are standards in the code for um, uh, you know the design of the building. But then the modification clause says, "Oh, don't worry. The planning director can change those things, and you can do what you want." And I, I think that's a very uh, bad um, uh, setup. Um, the other is on uh, provision 1906.110, density and lot size. I think there's a misspoken uh, there, but also it, 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 it a lot in, in the R1 zone, there is no minimum lot size. And so there's 12,000 square feet um, is needed for both dwellings, but there isn't a minimum. So you could have in theory a 2,000 square foot lot and a 10,000 square foot lot, which I don't think um, would stay in, sta you know, in character. So I have a suggestion in my note that no lot shall have an area less than 4,000 square feet. So that would be, you'd have a 4,000 and 8,000. Still different, but, um, but, and give some flexibility. Next one in the R2 zone section in the same area, the minimum lot area for a two dwell dwelling is 7,500 square feet. And then the, the statement, there is no minimum lot area, uh, no lot area for individual lots within development. So um, there's um, uh, anyway. So, but I there suggest that the minimum lot size in any development is 3,000 square feet. Also, back in the R1, uh, it says each dwelling may be less than um, 6,000 square feet. It's, well, it's not a dwelling; it's a lot. So there's a there's a uh, misspoken there. So it should be provided that the 12,000 square foot. Uh, is provided for both dwellings and then I also have there that no lots should be an area less than 4,000 square feet so um, it, uh, it's, it shouldn't have been there about the size of the dwelling it should have been there the size of the uh, a lot. Then the modification of building heights um, again um, there's a uh, effort here where you can um, somebody can just suggest how heights are measured, period, and that can be removed. So anybody can come up with a new idea on how to measure heights, and I don't think that's appropriate. Um, so that's 1B of 19.22100, modification of building heights. That should not be allowed. Somebody could say, well, I want to, you know, go off the top of the telephone pole, and there's no criteria that wouldn't stop that, okay, you can take it off the top of the telephone pole. I mean, there's no, there's no criteria to kind of limit you of what you want to do. Um, I, I mentioned the, the, the merger clause should be rejected and I guess staff is agreeing with that. So I won't go into uh, that. 
Um, also, uh, on environmental policy, I reject the proposal to eliminate the requirement to make all projects which exceed the SEPA threshold for category exemption subject to uh, review process to notice and posting. So there's this notice and posting is in several areas. And uh, in general, I don't think the city should be reducing its public notice and uh, postings for anything for public input which I mentioned earlier that the public really is um, uh, very, um, uh, you know, very helpful in things. Um, I won't go into, I, I had, in my comments, I had something on the private streets. I'll let you read that. I'm not making any opinion on that. I'm just giving you, uh, that's something that the home builders push very strongly uh, for private roads uh, so they, they can build at a lesser standard. Uh, and so that's a big policy issue, and, and you can read that in my, my note. Also, tiny house communities, I don't know where those were allowed. I couldn't find that in, you know, in sense of the, the use chart. Um, but uh, in conclusion, I think the above uh, recommendations that I had for, uh, that I'm bringing forward are reasonable, are based on what items I think rethink zoning proposal would have a negative effect on the community. Reducing information to citizens is not a desired approach to administration in the code. Citizens have good ideas and input, which needs to be brought to the table. There is no good reason to change who makes the decisions. Planning commissions need to the planning commission needs to be clear on the specifics of these chart, uh, changes before making a recommendation to council. No changes to Shoreline Master Program on who makes decisions. I agree with Mike Zielinski. Um I had down here in my notes to have staff do a chart showing changes both in who makes a decision and the public notice requirements. And I think they could do it very easily in saying that currently a public notice is this, and this is where we're proposing on changing it. And you don't necessarily have to tie it to all the specific uses. Um, I, I think it's important that you as a commission understand that and the city council. Um, there isn't a red line uh, um, things, it means legislative format. So it's very hard for people to review this document and to see what the changes are because it's saying, well, this is a whole new chapter and that's the old chapter we're not doing anymore. Well, you, you know, you, you, don't, you don't know what the changes are unless you read both documents and then also that, that's very difficult to do. Uh, uh, there is a need to be a minimum lot size defined in the code, not just any zone. I've suggested you know, 4,000 square feet in the R1 uh, and 3,000 square feet in R2. But uh, you, I, just leaving it open to the no standard, um, I think you'll get some crazy things. The modification all heights are measured needs to be removed. Uh, the merger clause uh, needs to stay in the code and um, make no changes to the SEPA notice and posting requirements for the citizens. Uh, thank you. That's it. Thank you, Mr. Koenig. Appreciate your, your input. Um, Kathy, you have anyone else signed up? Kathy? There, I'm sorry, I was muted. <laughs> yeah, I don't, uh, no one else pre-registered to speak, uh, but I have about 14 guests. Uh, okay, so there. I think what this time, what, what Kathy's going to do is she's going to uh, call out, call through the list of guests on the call today by the last four digits of your phone number. If you recognize those digits as yours and you are wishing to speak, that would be your opportunity to unmute your phone. And again, please uh, identify yourself, uh, your name and address, and, and then feel free to make your comment. Um, we do ask you to try to keep it to uh, you know two to three minutes if you can. There may be a lot of people who want to speak tonight. So um, Kathy, why don't you go ahead and start calling through the, the phone number list. Okay. Uh, Andrea? My comments aren't quite prepared. I didn't know I was on the list. So um, can you come back to me? Yes, I can. Thank you, Kathy. Angela? Filippo? Phil 
Mr. Filippo, are you wishing to speak tonight? Next on the list is David. Next on our list is Ismail Muhammad. It looks like he's leaving. I've got the JSH. Hi, this is uh, Jean Setti Hewitt on Grand Avenue in um, the Norton Grand Historic Overlay. First of all, I'd like to thank David Koning for his um, comments. I think that unfortunately, <laughs> a lot of what I wanted to talk about, Dave has brought up. So thank you, David. But I would, first of all, what I'd like to say is that the, some of the things that David was talking about for single family neighborhoods, I would like the Planning Commission to be aware of for these this new up zone for our three zones. Um, there are changing standards for R3 zoning and um, it increases the density, diminishes lot sizes and changes the standards. And it's all under the umbrella of consolidation, but it actually is an upzoning of R3 residential neighborhoods that'll, I think, negatively affect our historic overlays. Um, one concern I have just as an example is the unlimited density. The only check on this new unlimited density would be that we are in the historic overlay. And as we're experiencing now, the historic overlay has no protection because it's subject to planning department's decision. Whereas if it were still part of an ordinance, we, it, we would only be allowed to have 29 dwellings <clears throat> per acre. So I'd like the Planning Commission to take a look at that um, because many, there have been times when the Planning Department has made a decision regardless of what the Historical Depart, uh, Commission has decided or advised. And in addition, I'm asking the Planning Commission halt the changes to the Historical Resources chapter. It was totally rewritten with little or no historical Commission oversight or briefing. They haven't had a. They finally had a meeting in July, but from January through July there were no meetings, and um, there was no discussion in July about the um, the rewritten chapter or a briefing from the planning department. And I think that they need that because I think it weakens the protections for residential neighborhoods. It eliminates the need for like a demolition waiver for historic homes. And that concerns us as well in historic areas. And again, as David Koning said, I had issues with notice to um, public notice for permit applications for historic zones. Also the modification for building heights because it's a major concern for us for use and for heights um, because um, we're up against unlimited density across uh, a narrow alley in our backyards. And um, if the developers allowed to choose where they're gonna measure their building height from, we could end up with even more than right now, we're gonna have 35 foot walls across the alley from historic homes. Um, and that's kind of concludes my um, comments. I just really think that um, I really appreciate David Koning's and Mary's comments as well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, maybe I could interrupt here. This is Commissioner Yanisek. Uh, David Stahlheim, I, the issue of the, the up, this up zone in the, the Norton Grand area, I think that's something that I think we previously talked about. And I thought I understood that that was something that was not moving forward. Would this be an opportunity for maybe to, to chime in on that or correct that if, that, if I'm wrong about that? No, the uh, planning department actually actually um, proposed downzoning us, which is something that we've wanted for years, and it would give us greater protections. It would still allow multifamily development, but give us greater protections against development across the alley from historic homes, and that was taken off the table July seventh, and we weren't even informed of that. Um, David has given me some reasons why it was taken off, 
But with R3 zoning now, it's my understanding that density is going to change in all R3 zones unless you're in an historic overlay. I don't know, David, did, would, would you want to comment on that or? Uh, sure. The uh, So we've uh, briefed the Planning Commission on this, on, on both topics of this. Uh, in the multifamily zones, uh, we do not have any density limits. I think we talked about that at the last meeting or two meetings ago. And so the, the draft has no density limits with the exception that we have a density limit when you're in a historic overlay. And so we've used the existing density limit of uh, 29 units per acre in the R3 zone. So there's no changes whatsoever in the Norton Grand uh, historic overlay. It's currently zoned R3, would be zoned R, uh, UR3. The current density limits is um, is 29 units per acre and the proposed is 29 units per acre. As uh, uh, Gene mentioned, uh, the adjacent uh, zone, uh, which is currently zone urban residential, has no density limits currently um, and would not in the proposal either. So um, so I, I think that answers the question. Thank you. Thank you, David. And, and thank you for your comments as well. Um, Kathy, do we have anyone else? Yeah, um, how about Ismail Mohammed? I noticed you came back online. Hello, about, can you hear me? Uh, there you go. Okay, I'm sorry, I was muted. Uh, thank you so much. I only have, uh, I have commented in last meeting also there are some changes being suggested for the parking requirement for micro zoning and the number of units on micro units. I don't know uh, where are those and what are the changes being suggested and also the tandem parking requirement that's also being changed somewhat. Uh, I'm, I would like to know a little more about it. The third, I third point that I wanted to make was in the in the parking reduction requirements there are certain certain opportunities that can be available to reduce the parking requirement if we provide like a one stall for a or like a zip car or something like that that is something in our zoning, in, in our codes, maybe it's a little outdated right now because those zip cars and uh, are not, have we have not seen it in years in Everett and in Seattle, all those three major companies are pulling back because of the Uber and, and all those car facilities, those are available. So I would suggest that if we can reconsider those uh, uh, codes which are suggested for reducing the parking requirement and maybe add like a electrical electrical for, for the environment and a electrical charging station that can help uh, the community and people to encourage buy more towards uh, electrical and not the hydrocarbon cars. That's all for today. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Mohammed. Thank you. Uh, the next on our participant list here is Laura Gurley. Thank you. No comment tonight. Thank you. If I could interrupt real quickly, uh, Mr. Tisdell, we're getting a good shot of you, the side of your head with your, vid with your video right now. Okay. Okay, just I'm looking at my screen. Sorry. All right, I didn't know if you wanted to have your video on or not. So I don't know. I mixed okay. up anyway. Okay, the next um, participant I have listed is extension seven one five seven.
That better, David? Next extension is 0296. This is Glenn Ann's KV, name of Station Everett, and um, I'm happy to say that I appreciate David's work in this update, and also I'm happy to um, participate in the Planning Commission's uh, decision and consideration. I uh, support all the work that has been done and also want to comment on the SEPA requirements in that I believe SEPA is a, a positive public uh, engagement tool that you can use and I would encourage that that will be used. So um, thank you. Thank you. And the last one I have listed is 7187. And you can just star six to mute if you'd like to speak. Seven one eight seven. Okay, that so if that's everyone who is showing up, is there anyone else on the line who um, we did not call or um, we're not seeing here that is wishing to address the commission during this uh, public hearing? Yeah, it looks like Angela DeFilippo would like to Oh, right. Speak. Oh, great. Yes. Mr. Filippo, go ahead. You can just toggle your microphone on the menu bar. Or star six if you're uh, calling from your phone. Kathy, I know we also previously skipped over Andrea. Was she, um, we'll come back to her, Is, well, Mr. Filippo. Um. Hi, I'm here. Can you hear me? Oh, yeah, go, go, go ahead. Can you also okay. introduce yourself and your, your address for, for the record? Sorry, <laughs> I just had some um, just brief agreements. Um, I wanted to agree with Commissioner Tisdall, um, being in the real estate community myself, there are lots of changes going on and some of our changes, like he said, may not be applicable um, in a short amount of time. Um, also, I wanted to agree with um, um, about citizens being informed of proposals in the historic districts. And um, I think one of Dave Koenig's um, uh, examples was that historic Everett, which I'm a board member of, um, you know, has the opportunity to to help and advise people and give them knowledge about um, about historic homes, especially when we know that there's some kind of proposed change. Um, sometimes we have images that we can share and that type of thing. So I think giving public notice in the historic districts is important, as well as I agree with public notice as much as possible because taking away that notice. It's hard enough even when there is notice to get people involved. So not having notice really keeps the citizens out. And um, and I also agree about the way building heights are measured. Um, I've watched that happen recently where, you know, people decide to different ways of changing of, um, of uh, using building heights. So that's all, thank you very much.
Thank you. Uh, with Ms. DeFilippo uh, ready and wishing to, wishing to speak as well? She, she's having trouble with her mic, uh, but she did mention that she'll go ahead and provide us uh, some written comments. Okay. Is there anyone else on the line that we have not called yet that was um, wishing to speak tonight? That's all on this list that I've got. Okay. Well, maybe I'll wait a, a, a few more seconds, but I know everyone is, is a little awkward for everybody and something through technology. There can be uh, finding that mute button at the right time can be difficult. So um, I guess I'll give one more opportunity. If there's anyone else here on the line who um, go ahead and, and this be opportunity to speak up. Okay, well, definitely appreciate all of these comments and encourage anyone else uh, to make uh, continue making uh, written comments, send those in, and those are uh, reviewed by, by staff and by the planning commissioners. Uh, it looks like there is no more, there are no more community members wishing to speak. Uh, is there perhaps a motion to uh, close the public hearing except to leave the public record open for written comments uh, through 5 p.m. on Tuesday, September 8th of 2020. Uh, so we get a motion. Chair Yanisak, this is uh, Commissioner Holland. I just wanted to say thank you for all the people that participated. I think we had great comments this evening, but I would make a motion to close the public hearing except that the public record remain open for written comments through 5 p.m. Tuesday, September 8th. 2020. Thank you. Anyone to second? This is Commissioner Zielinski. I would second the motion. Thank you. Kathy, can you call for re roll or a vote? Uh, Commissioner Finch? Yes. Commissioner McGinn? Yes. Commissioner Zielinski? Yes. Commissioner Tisto? Yes. Commissioner Holland? Yes. Commissioner Labra? Yes. Terry Anasak? Yes. All right, so that closes the, the public hearing. But again, um, so everyone's clear that the record will remain open for written comments through the end of business on September 8th. So uh, please do um, continue to submit those, um, those in writing. Uh, I'll turn now to any commissioners uh, for any discussion, uh, questions, comments, or uh, requests to staff for um, review of any other matters prior to uh, potential action at the September 8th meeting. Uh, any any commissioners? Yeah, this is Commissioner Hall, and I, I got a question for uh, David. Uh, as we've heard some of the testimony tonight and some of the written stuff that we're gonna get in, and um, as we dive in a little bit deeper and you've gotta make these uh, presentations for a public hearing upcoming, would it be best for the commissioners to email you some thoughts that they have on uh, any any of the comments that we've received or any concerns that we have, just so you, ha you can get it in a timely manner and, and uh, you know, if perhaps there is some some changes or corrections that need to be made, you, you have an opportunity to do that. How would you like uh, at least the commission to proceed with you? Yeah, uh, this is David Solheim. I, yeah, I think that'd be great. So if you uh, see some things in particular, you know, things that stand out that you you want to make sure that are uh, discussed and addressed by uh, staff and the commission, then yeah, send me send me that list. Uh, you know, there's there's been a lot of um, you know not only the public input, but I've, I continue to get additional uh, internal input on uh, some things, and so we we've identified uh, quite a few uh, issues, and so we're going to have a, a fairly robust packet for you uh, come for your next meeting. Um, so uh, you helping to make sure that I don't miss anything would be fantastic. So yeah, I would encourage that. 
great. Thank you. And I would encourage it as soon as possible too. Uh, so I need to turn around this uh, by the end of next week so that you get it in time so you can digest it before a, a potential action meeting. So the sooner the better. I hate to say this. <laughs> This is Commissioner Lavra. I hate to say this, but it might be useful to see that in a marked up format so we can see what cha what changed. Um, maybe just available online or something. Yeah, uh, no, we will. Uh, so the uh, um, most of the chapters that you know are actually new chapters. They're, you know, it's a repeal and replace. And so what you will get for any of those new chapters will be a document that will be a red line version. So you'll you'll see it in track changes from that. Um, and uh, for those chapters that are an amending chapter, it's, it's red on red, so it's hard to find it. Uh, we will summarize where those changes are so you'll be able to find them. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Go ahead. David? Yes. Tisdall again. H has legal looked at um, the legitimacy or that these meetings are and the actions of these meetings? We pass this as it is, and um, then we, we move it forward to the city council. Um, do these team meetings or Zoom or whatever is used, are, are, are they um, a legal, um, you know, does it, it prove, does, does it meet all the tests of Open Meetings Act? I, I guess that's my real question. Yes, it does. Yeah, so the, uh, the governor's executive order and other things that have happened. Uh, it's we're, we're not only conducting the business of the planning commission, but we're conducting the business of the city council via team. So the city council is not meeting uh, in person either. They're meeting uh, remotely as well. Yeah. Okay. No, I just want to make sure we don't all go through this and then find out we get to do it again. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a great question. At the very beginning of the uh, uh, emergency declarations uh, by the governor, it was for essential business only, and uh, those changes were, I'm not sure when that took place, but uh, other business can now be conducted because, uh, you know, for Everett itself, for our, our things, we will not have any uh, in-person meetings through the end of 2020. So this is uh, our way of life until... Uh, January at the earliest, and I'll speculate that it'll probably go into spring. Okay, thank you for the update. You bet. Any other discussion or questions or comments? Commissioner Holland here again. Now, it's a different topic, but I didn't hear anybody else speaking up. But I, the um, Housing Hope application, uh, David, when do you think you can get us the uh, application materials for that uh, September meeting. Um, you know, we've kind of looked at this before as a commission at a different level, and I'm just, uh, it'd be nice to be able to get that early and, and digest some of that stuff. Um, yeah, I, uh, well, usually we send things out at least, a, you know, a week in advance. Um, let me see what I, what I can do. I can, uh, uh, I can send you. I mean, there's the public record is actually uh, published on our our website um, uh, for docket application, so you can certainly see the application because that is part of the public record. Um, so, what I'll do is maybe send that uh, those links to you so you can start uh, going through those documents because uh, uh, they will be part of the public record. So that'd be fine to share with you at this time. Yeah, perfect. I appreciate that. Um, I wasn't trying to give you additional work or anything, but yeah, if we can get a link to the what's been submitted. I know you had asked for additional material, so it sounds like that's all in so it can move forward now and uh, it'd be great to be able to get a link and, and look at that stuff. Yeah, yeah, no problem. Uh, we're just going to working on getting the, the notice of application out uh, probably tomorrow uh, to re-notify the neighbors of the hearing date and, and things like that. So that's just going to uh, start going out. 
So PIPA says that there actually is um, someone in the public <coughs> wanting to ask a question. Um, so, uh, Chair Yanisak, do you want to be able to open it up for that? Uh, yeah, I, I think we could do that. I know on this format, we have to be a little flexible, I think. Um, so I'd be happy to, to open up and take that question or comment. Okay, Jeff or uh, Pipa, go ahead and open the bridge to that person. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, yes go ahead. Uh, hey, David, um, would the public be able, um, Commissioner Lavra asked if um, if you were going to send a red line version of the changes. Would the public have access to that or is that just to the Planning Commission? Yeah, no, that's a great question. No, the public will post that to our website and we'll notify folks, but that's one of the reasons I want to get it out by, you know, my goal is the end of the 28th so that uh, not only the Planning Commission can see it, but the public can see it as well. Uh, and that's why I asked for the written record to be open also to September 8th so that you can uh, look at that and uh, respond to any of those changes that uh, any member of the public feels necessary. Okay, thank you. You bet. Uh, okay. Chair Yanisak, this is Commissioner Lars. Go ahead. Oh, yes. Hey, first, I'd like to ask a question of clarification. As reading through the, um, as reading through this, I, I see uh, proposed uh, zone uh, land use changes, um, and I wanted to just ask a quick question regarding the land use change to uh, Walter Hall Golf Course down in South Everett. Uh, Dave, is is that already slated in the uh, in the um, packet, or is that is that a proposed change that we have that can still be discussed uh, at a future meeting? Are, are you referring to the attachments that I had in the memo? Yes. Yeah, I mean, we. Uh, you can certainly, if you want to, uh, at this point, um, uh, or down the road. Um, um, what we had sent to you was uh, some changes, and it was um, to the land use designations of several of uh, city parks uh, in. Um, Originally, we were uh, uh, before we did the single family, we were not going to have a park zone. And then uh, when I started looking at the land use table, the local resource lands included everything from industrial to residential. And uh, that was not the intention of local resource land. So we went back into that and uh, we have proposed to have a parks and open space designation on uh, many of those uh, parks that were uh, in single family areas. Um, uh, in addition, there's one piece of port property, and Laura Gurley was on the line earlier. I, I talked with uh, the port, um, and uh, it's a mitigation site uh, in the in the Slough, I think Union Slough area. And uh, uh, also, we would have a parks and open space designation on that property that uh, is surrounded by heavy industry. And so, is that is that what kind of you're asking about, or? Yeah. yeah well, yeah. I mean. Uh, mostly what I'm most interested in is I just want to kind of because my my ability to be to participate in these is um, is well I, I have some new challenges with the telecommute across an ocean and across a dateline I, I do want to get some comments in regarding uh, at least specifically that proposed land use ch cha uh, designation change for the Walter Hall Walter Hall golf course uh, you know currently right now I, I think what we need to look at is you know how do we look at the best, the highest use of green space? I do not believe a golf course is the best and highest use of green space for for that area. Having the thirty-five dollar uh, 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 fee to go onto the course doesn't make it accessible to that community. Uh, on top of that, golf courses have environmental con uh, bring up a host of environmental concerns. Uh, I think we could do better green space there, and I think until we have a plan for better green space there, I don't want to see that particular lot be designated as a park because I think that would lock in the worst way that we could be using that land, which is a golf course. The city could have a be much better integrated green space that connects the community to that area that allows for uh, better utilization of the, of the open space and also can uh, afford for more housing there. We're still in a housing crisis. We have about 30% of our people you know, in this state are not going to be able to pay rent and will be evicted. Uh, the housing crisis hasn't gone away because of COVID, and we still need to be making sure that we're creating housing, especially if housing is affordable to the working families here in Everett. 
and making and I would highly recommend that the city start building condos there and have an integrated housing and green space play, uh, plan for that area to make sure that families who live here can afford to uh, start you know, buying homes and building a future here. And so that's why I'm extremely concerned by this proposal uh, to bring that over and uh, from into into green space and parks. I think it takes away a lot of cities discretion as well. Um, you know, there's a great book, The Hidden Wealth of Cities, and the most underutilized resource cities have is the land that it owns. And uh, I don't think that this, I think the city get, being given the fact it's going to be cash strapped coming forward, coming out of this recession, uh, I don't know if the golf course is the best tool to make sure that it recovers successfully. All right. That being said, I definitely will bring this up again, but I appreciate you humoring me right now and we share my thoughts. Thank you. Okay, uh, staff will certainly take a look at that. Uh, currently, the, the property is zoned for parks, and so that's what we're we're just trying to reestablish that. But uh, knowing uh, also, as uh, Commissioner Lark mentioned, is that there are some long-term plans to look at uh, potential um, future changes, and um, there's there's no specific plans other than to look at what that future is of of that property. So. Uh, so the discussions would be on the table at some point if there is a different use for that. I, I know that's the city's intention to, to take a good look at that. Thank you, David. I really appreciate that. Any other discussion? David, this is Commissioner Yanisak, and I guess I'll use this opportunity to add, add, add my voice. Um, I, I do, I, I guess I, I um, the public comments and the comments of, of Mr. Koenig uh, and some others about the, the change, some of the changes to the notice requirements. Um, I, I understand that and we, we did talk about this at a meeting and it was presented as to, you know, kind of what some of those issues are. Um, but I am generally one who believes that kind of more notice is in, in involvement is, is better than than less. Um, even if that, you know, comment is even if those comments and notice is related to something about which maybe the city has very little um, discretion. Uh, so I guess I would lend my voice as well to um, maybe ask to have the staff look again at, at some of those changes and see if maybe there is some maybe middle ground that could be established or found to, you know, maintain some greater, uh, you know, notice to public, at least some, some of the notices, uh, some of the notices just about, you know, posting, um, if not, you know, perhaps do away with any mailing of notice, that kind of thing. But um, anyway, I just wanted to lend my support to that and um, suggest that that's something that maybe we could still be looked at. Yeah, and we'll we'll be glad to uh, take a look at. It. I'm having a conversation with uh, the mayor's office um, tomorrow regarding uh, the subject, and so I'll be getting a little bit of a direction of of where they view that as. Um, just you know, I, I'm gonna you know be honest and blunt. I mean, our staffing levels are not anywhere near what they used to be, and um, we have a six month uh, backlog of land use permits, and part of the backlog of land use permits is additional notice and public comments and and even even to, to the other side of it the number uh, of modification requests that we do allow in the code right now uh, consume a lot of time and uh, of staff and uh, a backlog of that and so so part of that is uh, is balancing uh, us trying to uh, move forward uh, in these economic times and get projects out that are ready to uh, proceed um, but at the same time there are some other things there and so trying to Trying to find a middle ground on some of those things, we'll, we'll certainly uh, do our best. But I, again, I want to encourage the commission uh, to uh, make your own uh, feelings uh, known. So if you disagree with staff, uh, we don't take it personally. So if you want to recommend something different to city council, uh, please uh, please feel free to uh, to make that recommendation. Thank you, David. And I appreciate that it is a balancing act and, and it is hard to find the right place. Um, so, and I understand all the all the concerns on on all sides, and it's a it's it's a tricky balance. I, I I understand. Any other commissioner? Any other comments? Questions? Any other discussion?
Okay. Uh, David, any final um, staff comments or um, on regard to the public hearing? No, uh, thank you very much. Uh, this is the first public hearing I attended in shorts in my uh, 30 plus year career. So um, this is a new new one for me. So thank you uh, everyone for tolerating my uh, wardrobe that you didn't get to see tonight. <laughs> Great. Uh, is there any other business? Um, not aware of any, but um, okay. I guess with one last, Chance for any uh, commissioners uh, wanted or concluding remark? Okay, well, thank you everyone for participating. Thank you to all the members of the community. And remember that the, uh, the record will remain open for um, written comments and please continue to submit those um, hopefully sooner rather than later, but it will be open until through the, through the 8th. So, um, with that, uh, we will go ahead and uh, adjourn the meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Good job. Thanks. Enjoy your evening. Thank you. Good night.